Well, hey folks, it's your old pal, King Waspinator. Welcome back to Total Party Skills. Be sure to hit like and subscribe. I'd suggest hitting the dislike button, but you know, what's the point of that anymore? It's not real. So, um, this video might be like a day late to the conversation, but as you might have noticed, if you're on YouTube at all and watch, you know, certain ends of the entertainment or gaming sphere, Wizards of the Coast has done it again. Apparently they're editing out large chunks of uh, lore from Volo's Guide to Monsters. Now, um, this book is mostly just useful as a toolkit uh, in terms of having a bunch of like alternate stats for kinds of creatures so that you don't yourself have to you know, take the time to develop variants of goblins or variants of kobolds or more variants of orcs than what was just there in the basic manual. What it mostly does is it kind of fills in for a lot of core central essential monster species uh, for D&D. It, it gives, you know, like some of the background information that's not present in the basic monster manual. I mean, in the bulk of entries for creatures in the monster manual, maybe you get a paragraph or two about what they're actually like, and then the rest of it's just stat blocks. Um... From my point of view, the thing that I like find most useful about this is that it has write-ups for a, you know alternate player character races that I happen to like including. Not all of them, but like I'm like I like the Tabaxi, I like Kanku, uh, I like Aquans. I mean, like there's there's stuff in here to be mined and used, but um, in terms of like cutting out the lore to try to make some of the monster races like orcs and beholders and elithids somehow like more socially acceptable um the only person that's really hurting are the young and new up and coming dungeon masters out there who need that kind of fluff information uh most of us older experienced game masters don't really need uh, this book. Like I said, it's 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 a nice toolkit so that you have some stats for things already you know written up for you, and then you can just plug and play kind of a thing. But uh, like, wh why do you need any of the lore in this book? It, it's generically formatted for either kind of just generic D and D worlds and or forgotten realms. But like any any particular interesting campaign setting is going to have slightly different lore on how the monsters. And that setting work and operate compared to this one so uh and, and and you really especially if you have if you ever are dealing with experienced D, &D players you're, you're going to want to like on your own come up with different lore and different ways for a lot of these creatures to act because it's about the only way you can guarantee that you can keep you know the experienced know-it-all players out there uh to keep them on their toes is if things aren't necessarily behaving in the way they're expecting um Shaving all of it out, though, like, I mean, it's great that, yeah, if you've been, you know, running games and playing games and into, into the fantasy fiction genre for, like, decades of your life, and that's great that, yeah, you don't need this. This is, you know, I mean, just something to sit on your shelf, mostly. Um, but, you know, if you're, like, a 16-year-old or someone who's in college and you're, you know, fresh into, like, running D&D &D and, and you only have the monster manual and it's one little tiny blurb about how this, you know, creature that you want to use acts, uh, and, you know, that might leave you a little stymied or, or a little unable to, like, think on your feet as to, like, how this creature is actually going to operate in game once you're actually playing. Uh, and so for that reason, like, you know, st st stuff in this book is useful and removing it is only hurting you know, you're the people that you're trying to get to get into the hobby to buy all this shit. And so, like, that may be discouraging. Not to mention it's it's bad PR. Far more people are reacting negatively to this news than there are people out there reacting positively to this news. And then also, you know, you got the stupidity. It's also, you know, being talked a lot kind of in tandem with this about how uh, Paizo apparently is going to be removing all references to slavery from Pathfinder... Um, okay, like, are, are we on this thing where, like, we're doing the, the, the thing now where we're just gonna, like, uh, erase chunks of history and so everyone just pretends that nothing bad ever happened so we can all get along? Uh, you know, th there is kind of, like, a social engineering, mass psychology kind of angle to that kind of thinking that may, oh, you know, maybe that would work. We would just, just... Re convince an entire generation of humanity that something different happened in the past and then they won't have all these old baggage 
from you know their ancestors fighting each other throughout the centuries that still like be dragging things down and we can all get along on our perfect little planet of just economic trade and self-indulgence uh however you know that, that might work for a time but at some point someone's going to figure out what really happened and then a lot of questions are going to be asked as to why everyone's been lied to like this especially if it's an act of a, of a genuine purposeful you know uh, uh propaganda and social editing as opposed to just like there's some sort of disaster and we lost all the electricity and all the books were destroyed and we just you know we, we genuinely lost information about our past but this kind of stuff like like isn't this literally like what like the character in 1984 did for a living wasn't like his, his whole job was to go back through and edit historical documents to make sure everything matched up with the party line like um you know eh uh the idea that you know like yeah you know um to a certain degree, like role-playing games function on stereotypes. Uh, player character races are based on imaginary stereotypes of what a stereotypical elf would be, a stereotypical dwarf would be. A lot of the monster races are based on stereotypes because when you're a low-level beginning player or a low-level beginning dust and dungeon master, you, you don't have the, the attention span, mind space, or experience to try to make every last single NPC and creature that you encounter uh, in your little fictional imaginary universe that you're running with your players uh, to give them that level of like intimate, total empathy, understanding, and uh, you, you don't want to. That's, that slows the games down. It makes the game unfunctional. Uh, I mean, to, to a degree that the role-playing games are like a precursor to video games, you know, yeah, um, combat being you know and, and action adventure being such like core themes of how these you know adventures are structured uh it, like what, what what exactly is the goal here are, are we gonna somehow try to have a D, D where you never go up against anyone bad you, you you never fight it's just conversations around tea and bartering like um that that's that's a game that people can't play but uh this is not a good vessel for, uh, you know, life simulators. The, you don't play your character that much. Uh, it, it, it's dependent on other people being available to be able to, like, you know, whip your character out and have fun doing that. It's not like some video game where you can sit on your computer for, like, day after day after day running your little sim or, you know, like playing some sort of full immersion version of Fallout or the Elder Scrolls or something like that. Uh, you have a limited window of time when you have your other players together. Even if you're playing online, like, you have a scheduled time and a little window of time where this can go on. So, like, trying to tie your player characters into your identity as how, and how you think of yourself and, and trying to run it as like some sort of fictional life simulator of, of what it would be like if I was a dragon person living in merry old England. That's a, a terrible, terrible approach to be having. And you know, arguably, you know, it's one of those things of like, you know, D and D beyond and a lot of these role playing game companies, they, they want to like, you know, they want to maximize my sales and they don't want to alienate people. So of course they're going to say shit like D and D beyonds for everyone, except it's not. Um, the everyone has nothing to do with people's, you know, like, uh, sexual, ethnic, gender categories. Um, the, the thing that filters people out of these games is personal interest and personality type. And I would kind of argue that like people who are, that offended by the idea that beholders have a superiority complex or that, you know, like, uh, fictional slavery exists in fictional medieval times, uh, maybe they're just actually not the personality type to be playing these games and might be better suited playing a video game. Um, like, I just, I don't know exactly, like, in five years, is D&D going to be nothing but just, like, t-shirts and toys and no game at all because you know like at, at some point it just stops being a thing you just make up a character profile for yourself and that's it that's all you do that's the entirety of the game is like oh look i'm an elf and i got all these skills but i don't go on adventures because that's problematic and i 
don't play with other people because they might try to rape me and uh can't play online because of online harassment someone someone might pop up in the chat and start saying words i don't like uh and i i can't ignore that uh the internet was promised to me to be a, a utopian paradise um like is how much of this is is just because of this weird thing we do as a culture where we shield children so much from the truth of what adult life is like you know uh, through the fact that you know we we don't let kids hear certain material uh, we try to avoid using certain dirty language around them we don't want to bring up certain historical co subjects that are too complicated for parents who aren't barely educated themselves in history to try to explain to their kids um, and so all they get is just like this basic bitch filtered simple version you get in the limited window of time that you're sitting in your daycare I mean school um, <laughs> and then because you know like from the, at least from the 1990s on we've done such a good job of insulating children from the truth of reality that when they're grown up it's like this jarring like wait a minute what you expect me to what this might happen what kind of a thing and you know like role playing games were in a safe fictional environment where an imaginary character you control that is not you and is not an extension of your fucking identity it's just a simulated person that you make decisions for goes up against all sorts of matters of hardship and duplicity and and monstrous behavior maybe that might actually help inform you a little bit about the real world just in like you know something to indicate to you that maybe things aren't all that great out there you know maybe maybe it is going to be of a struggle and and maybe you are going to face hardships and adversity and all that kind of stuff but no no uh, we're, we're going to live in a cellophane wrap bubble wrap world or I guess, like, you know, uh, in the next D&D &D module, it's going to be, you know, uh, going to a tea party hosted by the Mind Flayers who, you know, just want to, you know, like, make sure that you're doing okay after your dog died or something. Or, you know, like, maybe beholders want to use their laser beam eyes to, like, give you some Lasex surgery so that... Well, wait, wait a minute, though. That's ableist because if your character's blind, they're, they're perfectly fine blind and should stay that way forever. Uh, you know... This is way more, you know, like, ridiculous than, like, the, the, the old satanic panic. You know, um, making, you know, Wizards, of the, well, it wasn't Wizards back then, making TSR jump through some fucking hoops so that they have to rename the demons and devils into, you know, Batezu and Tanari. It, it, it still was functionally the same thing, so who cares? Um, this is also, like, it, 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 it's, it's a kind of just a big, you know, fake show, um, Removing the lore from this book doesn't doesn't actually affect you at all in the terms of your ability as a game master to run this game however the fuck you want and that's still the, like the the thing that like they can't control like these aren't video games this isn't all centrally run through approved pre-stamped paid game masters who you can only get a hold of through Wizards of the Coast or whatever the controlling company of the game in question is uh, you know once they sell you the book. If you're able to gather, you know, two or three, five or more people together to play it, uh, it it's entirely out of their control uh, what you do with it. It's entirely out of their control. Um, so make the lore whatever you want it to be. You know, an uh, example of, of doing just that is the book I wrote, Orc and Bone. It's a... Uh, D20 based uh, OSR uh, setting uh, doesn't include the basic D&D &D rules but there's enough stuff in here that if you just at least bit familiar with how to roll attributes and how to run the basic mechanics of combat and stuff you don't even really need a rule book to go with this because it's got plenty of classes and plenty of races to play uh, it is designed specifically to key off the white box rules and most of the monsters and stuff that are in here and mentioned uh, you know I'll reference off that book but it's it's a monster setting where it, there's no humans. Humans are extinct. Uh, it's a world. It's a post-human world as opposed to like a non-human world uh, that you know recasts several classic monster races uh, in, in in the position of heroes, but without trying to retcon their entire backstory to say that oh they were never bad. Instead, it's a world where like no they were bad and they were on the fringe, and now with humankind gone, orcs and gnolls and a few others suddenly find themselves in this odd position where it's up to them to defend 
what is left of civilization from all the monsters left over in the shadows of human civilization. Uh, you know, orcs versus vampires is kind of like the core dynamic of the thing, although it's, it's more than that. And uh, if, if you're looking for something that'll, like, let you play all these dark races that that it doesn't try to, like, turn them all into a bunch of Pollyanna goody two-shoes. You might want to check this out on Amazon and or uh, drive through RPG if you just want the PDF. But, uh, the, you know, putting your money where my mouth is, I don't know quite how to phrase that, but, like, this is the kind of thing that you should be doing if this shit annoys you. They're taking it, like, the lore in here is already generic and watered down and unnecessary. I mean, there's tons of other D&D. &D. You can use old AD and D stuff to, that describes orc behavior to figure out how you want the orcs to run in your setting. You don't actually ever actually need this. Most of this is a fucking waste of money. The half of why it's expensive is just purely because of the presence of the hardcover and the quality of the paper. The actual written information in here would like if to cut out all the fluff art and compact it all into a page better. We don't have all these big margins and gaps in between everything. This would be like a third the size it is, if even that big. So, I don't know what to tell you guys. Um, a little bit of a tempest in a teacup. It's annoying, and it's purposeless. Uh, the only people that uh, Wizards of the Coast is going to hurt by doing things like this, of like trying to counter-revise their own books and their own source material, all that's really going to hurt are the people who are trying to get into this. The people that they need to get into this game, because once you sell... To experienced players, once they've already bought their collection of books, they don't really have to buy anything else. And so since you've got to have constant sales and you can't just rest on your laurels of like, well, we sold a thousand copies and that's all we got to do. No, you got to sell another thousand copies if you want to keep getting your stock investments and you don't want, you know, your bosses at Hasbro to come breathing down your neck. So you got to get new people to play the game because the only people who really buy anything of a significant number are the fucking game masters. Players might need to own some dice. They might want to buy some little accessory or something stupid. It's, most of that stuff is not even things that necessarily even have to come from Wizards of the Coast, so it's not like they themselves might even get any profit off that at all. The, the people who actually buy their products are the game masters, and so they need new game masters to get into the hobby and embrace it. And cutting out all the information they need so that while they're learning, they know how to run stuff. Like, who, who does that serve? Who does that serve? You know, like, some asshole on Twitch who, you know, got bent out of shape because they were raised and trained actively in their scholastic environment to be upset and constantly looking for offense around every corner. Who cares if they're hurt? The secret is, is they're gonna be hurt anyway. If it, if it wasn't Volo's Guide to Monsters that day that, that got on their nerves, if this didn't exist, they still would have found something. They would have been bitching about Vampire 5th Edition again, you know, or you know, riffs or saying something bad about DCC or maybe Call of Cthulhu. I mean, did you know that Cthulhu was invented by a guy who wrote racist poetry back in the 40s? Oh, my God! You know, um, that kind of stuff. They were going to be upset anyway. Uh, you know, so you, you, all you're doing is just training them that, like, they get attention, uh, and treats, uh, when they complain. So you're just making the, you're making the situation worse for yourself and for others by capitulating to this kind of shit. Um, I'm surprised that they're, I, I guess Mordenkind and Tome of Foes is gonna have to be next on the chopping block, so they just hadn't gotten around to it, uh... Tasha's Cauldron of Everything is probably the golden child of, of the rule books. Um, since it gives you the, like, you know, you can just make your character be anything without any guidelines or limitations at all, which is totally fun. Totally fun. And helps for, like, a good immersive storytelling experience. Just letting people play literally whatever they want with any abilities they want and no pushback or the ability to say no to that. Um... Players, if you're for some reason you're just a player and you, you don't run this shit, the characters in these games are not you. They are not an extension of you. They are not an extension of your personality. They have nothing to do with your identity. If you're using these games 
to manifest some sort of hidden identity of some sort of transspecial bullshit, don't. There's video games for that. Go draw some cartoons on, on Twitter or maybe bring Tumblr back. TikTok, maybe. I don't know. I'm too old for that shit. This is not what that kind of game is. Uh, enough said. And like I said, if you want like some alternate, a, a, a vision of alternate lore that can be used or an example of taking some classic villainous races and spinning them around where they're protagonists in your story without, you know, like turning it into some sort of like SJW ridiculous nightmare of contrivances. Like I said, check out Orc and Bone right here. Look how thick it is. Mmm. It's tasty and delicious. Goes with the white box, your classic BX style rule system. You can also you can combine it with basic fantasy and most other of your your more generic standard OSR games. For that matter, you can also use AD and D rules. But like I said, like an experienced game master who knows D and D D twenty system very well wouldn't need a rule book at all. Aside from like maybe for some monster sats, because I don't reprint a bunch of mo monster sats that already exist in another book. I just give you information on how they act. <sighs> Which is all any of this is supposed to do. It's just supposed to be telling you how these creatures are going to act in any given situation. Removing that, it, it, it's not like, are they going to replace it with something good? Is, is, is the big long chunk of orc lore that they're going to be cutting out going to be replaced with anything to fill in that gap? Or are they just yanking it out? Like, what, what exactly is the goal? How is this helping the specific paying audience they need to sell more products? I don't know. But maybe you know, and you can tell me in the comments below. Be sure to hit like. Be sure to hit subscribe. Share this, uh, 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 you know, internet stuff. Stay waspinated. And be sure to have a happy Kwanzaa.